Uh, as we look to the text this morning, though, part of what I wanted to do is I, I have planned my calendar out for preaching for a while. So this is an unusually large portion of Scripture uh, that we're going to cover this morning. You'll see that on the, the screen. We're covering Acts 25 through 28, verse 16. And so there is some rhyme to my reasoning here because I am hoping to do one more message in Acts, which is planned next week, and then, Lord willing, we'll get into some more specifically themed Christmas messages uh, for the rest of December. We're going to go through Christmas in the Psalms, particularly, uh, as we, we go through there. And so you can be looking forward uh, to that. And then, Lord willing, in the new year, in January, we will be starting, as I have maybe hinted at for some of you who have been paying attention, a new series in the book of Genesis. Uh, and so we'll be starting to work our way through the book of Genesis in the new year. And so you can be looking forward uh, to some of that as we move ahead into 2024. But I'm condensing what was going to be actually three messages here into one this morning, but I think it's actually of the providence of God that we get to do that. Because as we look at what's going on, there's, there's some themes of repetition, particularly when Paul gives his testimony again to Agrippa and Festus. He is recounting events that we've already seen take place, that he's already had the opportunity uh, to give his testimony several times uh, throughout the book of Acts, which Luke records. There's also the reminder here as we look to the text that when this day seems long, when Paul has been here, as we pick up at the end of chapter 24, Paul is left in prison by Felix after he hands the case over to Festus. If you start to do the math and you start to do the recollection of how long he's been there from the time he is taken into custody to where we find ourselves picking up here at the beginning of chapter 25, he's already been in prison for two years. He is going, it's going to be another two years before the events that we read about here and we survey and summarize in chapter 25 through chapter 28 take place. It's a long process. It's an arduous journey. And as we gave hints at uh, in the song this morning that I sang, there's a weariness. There's a difficulty that he's experienced. And that's something that many of us here can even identify with. I'm coming back from a funeral on a long journey. In the process, I've talked to some of you and I've been praying for some of you who have been going through difficulties and trials of your own. Some of you have ongoing pain ongoing struggles. Some of you have recent diagnoses that have been weighing heavy upon you. You know that there's a long journey ahead physically with your health. And God is going to give strength and grace. You've experienced that. You have His assurances in His, in His Word for that. And yet, it does not remove the reality of the trial that lies before you. Some of you are coming here this morning, maybe with, with problems of your own. The weariness in need of hope, in need of God's grace. Paul certainly found himself in that kind of a position in the circumstances, in the trials that he was experiencing. And they took place, again, over a long period of time. There were times where he grew weary, but he also needed to understand that God gives grace to endure. During this Christmas season, we often, again, hear of weariness. We, fear, we hear of hopelessness. The statistics tell us that 55% of Americans during this time of year between Thanksgiving and New Year's experience what they call the holiday blues, with loneliness being a, a constant affirmation and complaint. Gen Zers, uh, 75% of Gen Zers and single adults say that this year, in particular leading into the holiday ceiling, season, they are feeling lonelier than other generations uh, if we're looking at the demographics, which is maybe a reminder for us as Christians not to take it for granted. Among those feeling lonely, the top reasons cited are not being around loved ones, 41% reported that. Seasonal depression that just happens to come with this time of year, another 37%. And then 36% attribute their feelings of loneliness to experiencing grief, the absence of somebody who you've shared 
holiday memories with, and they're not, no longer accessible, no longer with us, if we might say it that way. More than a quarter of Gen Zers and Millennials attribute, attribute their loneliness to social media. So maybe there's feelings of inadequacy or discontent spurred on by the happiness of others. Here's a statistic that you might not think about, but members of the LGBTQ community face more holiday loneliness than any other demographic analyzed, with 76% experiencing the winter blues. Those people are more likely to cite poor relationships with family members as the reason for their loneliness. 33% say that they struggle with substance abuse during the holidays. You say, well, Pastor, what difference does that make to people like us? It's a reminder that people need hope. And we can write some people off sometimes in our minds that they, they stand in opposition to us, and maybe that's the consequences. But that's not how Christ acted. That's not how Jesus thought. And we need to remember, just like Paul remembers here, that there are times to speak up. There are times to give out the hope of Jesus Christ, to speak boldly and directly. But there's also a reason that we need to step back and realize Jesus came to give hope in a dark place, in a dark world. And the manifestations of that darkness and that confusion, that loneliness, that weariness is not to be thought of as an opposition, as, as a contrast in some senses here. It's to be reminding us there's a reason Jesus came to give light where there is none, where there is only darkness. Let us think through those things as we read the passages. But even Christians here today are not immune from feelings of loneliness. The psalmist says in Psalm 25, as he prays to God, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely, for I am afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me, he says to God, bring me out of my distresses. So in today's message, in this summary of the text, I want to remind us that in the course of long trial, in the course of difficulty and darkness, God shows His power. If you're using the outline to follow along on the back of your bulletin, that's the first point that we're filling in. God shows His power. And He does so by preserving His purposes. As we've already mentioned at the end of chapter 24, Paul has been in prison for two years. As we pick up in chapter 25, in verse 1, Luke writes, Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking a favor as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. And as you, summer, as you scan through this part of the passage, you see that there is a purpose, there, there, there's a plot that's beginning to be revealed. Luke, it, some commentators have actually speculated that during this two years, and it's going to stretch out as we keep reading, to about a four-year process between the time uh, Paul is taken into custody in Jerusalem and but eventually ends up in Rome to testify uh, in the Roman court in the, the capital of the empire. Uh, that this was probably the time where Luke is practically, as he is a companion of Paul, uh, trying to give him encouragement and stability, is maybe where he actually starts compiling the facts that are going to lead to the construction, to the writing of the book of Acts. Uh, he is able not only to access Paul and interview him, there's not really much else to do. Paul is quite literally a captive audience uh, as, as Luke is getting his source material. Uh, but there would have been a lot of other Christians there in Jerusalem who had centered there in the church that he could confirm some of the details that he wasn't there for. Think the people who are there on the day of Pentecost have access to Peter, have access to some of the other uh, apostles who are there in Jerusalem to verify uh, the realities of what God had done in that early time. But now he's in custody, he's in Jerusalem, as we've picked up here, and the Jews who are responsible for his arrest are trying to manipulate the situation. So let's bring him back to Jerusalem. Let's bring him here 
And on the way, we will ambush him. We will take his life. Paul has already gotten wind of this. We've seen in previous chapters, the plots have been uncovered by his nephew and others who have, have, that's what led to his uh, relocation here in the first place. But as we pick up in verse 9, as Paul is in verse 8 in the previous verse, pleading his innocence, saying that there I, I pose no threat, and furthermore, Christianity poses no threat. Verse 9 says, Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, says to Paul, Do you wish to go to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? As we've made a case in the previous weeks where we've led up to this, Paul says that I pose no threat. I am innocent of these charges. Christianity actually is not going to be something that is disruptive to society. Christianity is one that calls for us to be orderly, calls for us to be living according to God's law. We want to be a blessing. We want to be an encouragement. We want to be a help to others. So what does Paul say? Verse 10, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know. If I then am a wrongdoer and I have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, then no one can give me up to them. He says, I don't want to go try, be tried in a court where they've already reached their verdict. They already know what they're going to do. So he says, I appeal to Caesar. I want to go into the jurisdiction. You obviously, as the Roman ruler here, the one who should be in charge, seeing through their inconsistencies, you should be one to bring justice here. But you are caving in to their demands. You are listening to their influence. So I want to go to the highest court. I appeal to Caesar. So Festus, in verse 12, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered to Caesar, you have appealed to Caesar, you shall go. And what we say here is that God is preserving his purposes. We've already had a prophecy, if you look back in uh, chapter 23, in verse 11, as he has uh, had that audience with Jesus while he was in his jail cell. The following night, the Lord Jesus Christ stands before Paul and says, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so also you must testify in Rome. Paul knew that God had a purpose. Paul knew that God was going to use him. He had already expressed longings to the people who were in Rome that he hadn't been to yet, that he wanted to go there. He wanted to have fellowship with them in God's truth. Romans chapter 1 and verse 9, this is the words of Paul himself. He says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Now when he wrote Romans 1, 9, and 10, was he thinking, and the way that we'll get there is by coming in custody. Am I looking forward to a courtroom appearance? No, he's thinking, I'm going to come and have fellowship with you. We're going to have maybe a week of meetings or you know, something like this. You know, I, I want to enjoy your company. I'm going to stay in your homes. We're going to break bread together. We're going to study God's truth together. We're going to worship together. This is not how he imagined it. But he knew that God had a purpose. He knew that God had a plan. God had already given him those assurances. This wasn't how he expected it to happen. But this is how God was manifesting itself. And so, he, Paul not only sees that God is being true to what he has prophesied, what he has promised, but the message that he has been called to proclaim also has not changed. He's already, as we read there in Romans chapter 1 and verse 9, understood that his life is about serving the message of Jesus Christ, serving the message of the Gospel. It's why he wanted to go to Rome, and it's what he ends up sharing with Agrippa and Bernice in Acts 26. And so let's pick up there in Acts chapter 26 and verse 18, and we'll start reading down as we see how God is not only preserving His purposes, but He is making sure that the Gospel is being clearly communicated. As Paul is giving his testimony before Agrippa, who is a descendant 
of one of the king's Herods that we read about, starting all the way back in Luke chapter 2, this time of year, uh, the, in the days of Herod the king, in, in Ma- Matthew chapter 1, when the wise men come and say, we have seen his star in the east and come to worship him, they go to Jerusalem and King Herod says, here, go here, we've, we've conferred with the, the priests and the, 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 the scribes and authorities, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, and so you will find him and you tell me so I can worship him too. You remember that part of the story, right? But he doesn't have that intention to go and worship. Instead, he has the idea that he is going to weed out any possible threats to his throne, to his power. And Jesus, along with Mary and Joseph, are able to escape to Egypt. And then Herod wipes out all the infants in Bethlehem. This is not that Herod. This is, though, one of his descendants. Particularly if you're reading the record, this is Herod Agrippa II. There's some pretty unnerving and unsettling things that are going on here. It mentions his wife, Bernice, uh, who is also thought to be at least his half, if not whole, sister. So they're living in an incestuous relationship here in the passage. Paul is speaking in a very direct and confrontive way, though, because as you might remember, Herod, the one that we read about in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, is a Jew. He is one of the local authorities that has been allowed to remain in power by the Roman occupation. And when Paul speaks to him, he says, you know the truth. You know what I'm telling you. And so we pick up in verse 18 of Acts chapter 26. This is the reason that Jesus was sent, Paul says. He was sent to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, Paul says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He's giving his testimony. And he says, I declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, throughout the all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, fulfilling the great commission there of Matthew 28, that you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. It is that they should believe and that they should evidence that belief in their actions and what they do. And for preaching this message, Paul says in verse 21, the, this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. But here is what I've come to proclaim, he says, picking up in verse 23, that the Christ, the Messiah, that Jesus, being the fulfillment of those prophecies, must suffer And that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. This is the truth of Jesus Christ. This is why he has come. We understand that God, the creator of the universe, the creator of the world and everything in it, became a human being, was born in that manger in Bethlehem was made in the likeness of men, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What difference does that make to you, friend, listening to me here this morning? It's the reality that you, who are estranged from God, the hopelessness that you perceive even now in your life is not just because of loneliness or despair or unfulfillment. What you are experiencing that maybe you can't even put the full description on is because there is a void in your life that was left there by God and the only God can fulfill. He is the only one who can give you hope, can give you certainty, can give you peace both in this life and in eternity to come. And what happens after death? This is the reality that we are separated from Him because of our sin, because of who we are, and because of what we have done. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to earth, gave His life. He died the death that we deserve, bearing the consequences for our sin on Himself. So that those of us 
who believe. Those of us who turn from our sins and put our trust in Jesus Christ can have salvation, can have forgiveness of sins, can have the hope of heaven and spending eternity with God, being reunited with Him instead of estranged from Him, instead of being His enemies, being called His sons and daughters. This is the hope that Jesus Christ has come to give. This is the message that Paul was sent to proclaim. And this is the message that he says in verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the apostles? I know that you believe. These prophecies that I'm telling you about aren't any mystery to you. This hope that I'm giving you is something that demands a response. It demands a conclusion. The ESV says in verse 28, And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Sometimes in the readings that we've read in the King James, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. We've read it like he's almost on the verge of things. Although some now have maybe drawn with the, the differences in translation here and how this phrase is rendered, that maybe Agrippa is almost asking sarcastically, do you really think I'm going to become a Christian, Paul, because of what you're going? I don't think it's either that it's an indication that Agrippa is right on the verge. He's almost on the cusp of things. But I also don't think he's being sarcastic. I think he understands exactly what it is that Paul's trying to do. But he's also saying, I understand the truth, but I need more time. Are you really thinking that you're going to close the deal right here with me right now? I'm not sure. He, he's, he's expressing a little bit of hesitancy. He's expressing skepticism. But here, Christian, it's a reminder for us that as we think of how God has established His message, we can't be hesitant. When we have the opportunity, we need to make sure that we give out the truth. It's important to establish relationships. We had the opportunity to do that as a church yesterday with the, the event that we hosted. We had, I don't know, between 50 and 100 uh, people who were, were here from outside the community, faces we'd never seen before. As Pastor John said, you know, there's people up here seeing the sets, and we're, we're inviting them to the musical, uh, making different kind of connections. We're, Lord willing, going to be hosting another one in another month or two here. Just having that continuous opportunity to make connections, to, to help establish who we are, get them comfortable, get them in the doors. I won't give you any delusions. We didn't get the chance to walk down the Romans road or, or you know, give out salvation messages yesterday. But there is going to be a time where those things will be necessary. God works through His truth. God works through the reality of the Gospel message. I saw relatives... Uh, earlier this week on Tuesday when I preached that funeral message at my grandmother's service. Relatives I hadn't literally seen uh, in a decade or more, some of them. Some of them I hadn't seen since I was 10 years old. <laughs> that that kind of dates date, dated things for us all a little bit. But you know what? I didn't, I, could, I didn't have the time to do anything more than what I, ha I had the opportunity to do that, that morning. And that was to give out the Gospel. To give out the hope that my grandmother taught to her four- and five-year-old Sunday school class at the Baptist church uh, that she attended in Bangor for so many years. It's the, the truth that Jesus Christ died to save sinners. and Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the truth that we had to give out. That's the truth that we had to put forward. That's the truth that my grandmother thought was important. It needed to be communicated. And that's the truth they needed to hear. That's the truth that Paul says to Agrippa, you need to be confronted with. You need to realize there is a conclusion. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. That is the message that we must proclaim. God is preserving His purposes. God has established the message that we are to proclaim. But He's also, in this section of Scripture, showing how He is protecting his people. Look in chapter 27 and beginning in verse 21. By this time, Paul has been sent from being in custody in Jerusalem, going to Rome. He's going to hear the message of Caesar. But 
Unfortunately, they didn't have air travel. They didn't even have uh, four-lane highways uh, back that day. He had to hop on a boat. And it was going to be a long and arduous process to make his way across the Mediterranean. And so if you survey what's happened before this, what, what's going on is they get on board a ship. They're going to go eventually to Rome. But seasonally, it was a time of storms. Paul actually warns them through his own knowledge and through a, a, a prophetic word that he receives from God, we should not go. There's going to be loss of damage uh, 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 onto the ship. There's going to be loss of property and potentially loss of life. The captain ignores him. They make the plans to go anyway. And Paul, while they're involved in the storm, says, we are going to get shipwrecked. We're going to run aground, but nobody's going to lose their life. But this is the reality. You should have listened to me, but since you didn't, we are going to be running ground. We are going to be stranded on an island. This is where we pick up in verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong, to whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. God gave him that reassurance. But what does Paul say? You need to be encouraged. Yes, the circumstances look bleak. They're threatening. But God has given us this assurance. Take heart. Be encouraged. Do not be afraid. Why? Because God has promised to protect us. There is no safer hand that we can be, Christian, than in the hand of God. No matter what the trial, no matter what the diagnosis, no matter what the difficulty, no matter how lonely and isolated you might feel, we must remember to turn to God in prayer. Remember His faithful love. You may not have the kind of promise that Paul had with an angel telling you exactly what's going to happen. But here's what we do have. The promises that we know, Romans 8.28 that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purposes. The circumstances may be heavy, but the endurance and strength that God supplies is real. His purposes will ripen fast, as one hymn writer says, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. What we are called to, like Paul here was called to as well, is that when we understand what God has done, God's power that has been manifested to us, we must keep believing. We must keep believing. Which means, among other things, that we must follow His plan. God's plan for us is to put faith and trust in Him. Is to live according to the principles that He's set out for us. And even as we learned in this passage, look at chapter 28 as we skip ahead to verse 14. By this time, they've recovered from the shipwreck. They've been rescued. He's traveling through now on land in Italy, making his way to Rome. And this is what Paul or Luke records in chapter 28 and verse 14. As they're on the road, making their way to Rome. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet them, meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. What do we learn about God's plan there? Here it is, friends. There's a reason why we come together on Sunday for church. It's not just so that we can hear about God, so that we can worship God. That's, that's a, it's an important part of it. Maybe the prominent part of it. But there is also the reality that, as the author of Hebrews says, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but we exhort one another, we encourage each other, we build each other up. Part of the, part of the, the problem that we read about as we 
introduced the message this morning, those feelings of despair and loneliness. Why? It's because people are isolated. People are withdrawn. How do we experience God's grace? How do we experience God's strength? Part of that reality is just the noise and the hubbub of people. People give comfort. After the funeral on Tuesday, we went over to my aunt's house. And uh, all of her kids are, are like my, my dad's kids. She had three boys. My, my, my dad and mom had two boys and a girl. And we've all gone our separate ways. The houses are empty. It's now at my aunt's house. It's her, her husband and her dog. <laughs> you know? And it was, they were just saying how nice it was that everybody basically who came to the funeral came over afterwards for food and had games playing, conversations going. And what happens at a time like that? You know, the funerals are sad. You're thinking of the loss. You're thinking of the deprivation. But the comfort wasn't even necessarily in what was said in that point in time. It was just the reality that I don't have to be alone. That there's something there that we can experience life and joy together just to the comfort of each other's presence. How much more real is that, friends, when we experience that kind of comfort by being with each other? When you know somebody who can't be here, how much joy can you bring to them by a visit, by making a contact? You see, Paul here, he couldn't experience all of the fellowship he wanted to, but the very fact that they came out on the road to greet him gave Paul strength, gave Paul encouragement. Part of God's plan is for us to be known by the love that we share with each other. That's how people are going to know we're Christians. That's what Jesus says. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for each other. Love in observable, tangible, markable ways. If you keep believing, you can't keep believing in isolation. It's got to manifest itself in investing in someone else. Follow God's plan, which means that we are going to share His hope. We are going to not keep it into ourselves. It's meant to be lived out in community. You read about miracles, prophecies fulfilled in this, this section of the passages and what's going on. His bold testimony as Paul testifies before Agrippa. And through all the trial, through this literally four years of imprisonment and, and horrible journeys, shipwrecks, all these other things, you see consistently that Paul remains a conduit of God's grace, a proclaimer of his hope. He doesn't look inward and see the weight and the difficulty of his circumstances. God, why did you let me run shipwreck? Why am I here in this prison? You see a little bit of his revelation of his mindset when he writes to the Philippians. God's worked it out because I'm in prison here and I have a captive audience. I can talk to people about the Gospel and they can't get away. This is what God has given to me. He's, he's got a different kind of a mindset. It's not one of despair and futility. It's one of saying, what is God going to do through me? How is God going to use me in this circumstance? We can wait, get weighed down with the cares or we can choose to see it like God wants us to see it. That He will not abandon us. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. So God is my helper and I will not fear. Follow God's plan. Share God's hope. And overcome your fears. When Paul sees those men in the people who have come out to greet him in, in verse 15 of chapter 28, when Paul sees them, what is it says he does? He thanks God and he takes courage. He had told others to take heart. He had told others not to be afraid. But it wasn't just a message for them. He had to take it for himself. He had to do what he knew God wanted him to do. He couldn't be afraid. He couldn't be despairing. He also had to be encouraged by God's truth. Friends, God does give us the grace to endure. 
to overcome affliction, to withstand trial. But we must remember that as you are here this morning, not knowing hope, feeling disconnected, feeling lonely, God is available to you, friend. He can give you forgiveness. He can give you salvation. And He has made that available to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That means you can have that hope. You can have that assurance. But Christian, you also should remember this. God is supplying that message of grace through you to others. God gives grace to endure. Are you willing to be a conduit of His grace and His strength to someone who has a need? Whether it is that person who needs to hear about salvation, or whether it is somebody who's feeling despair and loneliness because of isolation, because of a circumstance that they can't get out. And they need you to be a bearer of the light that shines in their dark place. They need you not to condemn them for some of their lifestyle choices and just to listen to know that you love them and you love them unconditionally. Friends, remember that God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. and He expects us to show that grace, that mercy, that love, to preach that message of forgiveness and renewal and regeneration and change to others.